Ladies and gentlemen, if you've come here this evening to see the two-headed calf, the giant mermaid from Fiji, or the flea circus, please plan to return tomorrow evening for our regular show. Tonight, Robinson's Dime Museum is offering you an unprecedented opportunity to hear from another oddity, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. Back in the days of the Civil War, Dr. Walker served as a surgeon with the Union Army. Yes, folks, that is correct, a woman surgeon. What's more, she rejects conventional female dress and has, for many years, worn the garments reserved for males in our society. Is she a man? Is she a monstrosity? Or is she a pioneer, the first in the line of women who will serve as doctors on equal footing with male physicians in the future? One thing is certain, her story will have you shaking your head in amazement. Please welcome Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Robinson's Dime Museum Traveling Lecture Tour. Now, it may seem strange that I, a woman of such exceptional accomplishment, should be lecturing at cheap dime shows such as this. But in the 22 years since the Civil War ended, Americans seem to have decided to stop thinking about the war. They wanted to put it out of their minds. And so I have allied myself with cheap dime shows such as this to reach a wide audience. I have been told, however, that you are not the usual cheap carnival sort of attendees. You are people of keen minds and sharp intellect. You realize, of course, that I am the only woman ever to serve as a surgeon in the Union Army. I am the only woman ever to receive the highly prized, the coveted Congressional Medal of Honor given to me by President Andrew Johnson for my devoted service to tending the sick and wounded in the Civil War. Yet newspapers far and wide claim that I am nothing more than a sideshow freak, a monstrosity in men's clothing reduced to lecturing at carnivals. The Toledo Blade ran a headline that said, Dr. Mary Walker, once on the platforms of princes, now on the stage of freaks. Another newspaper claims that I have coagulated into a freak. Let me assure you, ladies and gentlemen, those cheap attacks mean nothing to me, for I have stood on the battlefield of the Civil War, and I have seen our country's flag drenched in blood. I have held the hands of dying men and I have stood beside the surgeon's amputation table and watched the pile of severed limbs grow higher and higher and higher. Yes, the world has called me hardened and brazen, but it has taken a hardened and brazen woman like me to endure and prevail. Let me begin my story this evening with the story of a common soldier. Where else does war begin? It begins the day a husband, a father, a brother, or a son answers the call to serve the cause. Chances are this young man's first goal was to reach the battlefield before the war ends. Most everyone, including President Lincoln, believed that the war would last only three months this young man's entry into military life would have begun at training camp. There, he would learn how to load and care for firearms. He would learn how to pitch a tent, how to build a fire. He would learn how to follow commands. He would learn how to follow orders. He would learn how to stand guard in darkness and foul weather. The soldiers used to say, that the first thing they did in the morning was to drill, and then drill, and drill again, and lastly, drill. Now, just as this young man came ill-prepared for war, so did the medical establishment and the training of doctors ourselves. Prior to the war, medical school was not regulated. 
there were no requirements for entry. Doctors did not practice on actual patients. Instead, we listened to lectures and did not practice on actual patients. In some states, dissection was legally prohibited. Harvard Medical School had no microscopes or stethoscopes until after the war ended. There were not more than 20 thermometers in the entire Union Army. Was it caused, we wondered, by too much fried food? We called that death by frying pan. Was it caused, as some believed, from lack of fresh fruits and vegetables? Or was it caused, as others claim, from smelling the air rank with the odor of rotting corpses? What we know now, of course, that it was caused by filth. The latrines were upstream from the source of bathing, drinking, and cooking water. There was improper disposal of waste. The soldiers used to say they didn't need to move their provisions from one camp to another. The maggots moved it for them. Now, just as this young man came ill-prepared for war, so did the medical establishment and the training of doctors ourselves. Prior to the war, medical schools were not regulated. There was no requirement for entry. Doctors in training listened to lectures and did not practice on actual patients. In some states, dissection was legally prohibited. At the start of the war, Harvard Medical School had no microscopes, no stethoscopes. At the start of the war, the Union Army had only 20 thermometers. My fellow physician, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, said this. I firmly believe that if the entire medical establishment were sunk to the bottom of the ocean, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. <laughs> it quickly became clear that I, armed with my medical school diploma from Syracuse Medical College, was needed by my country. And so I left my home in Oswego, New York, and traveled to Washington to offer my services as a fully credentialed physician. If I expected to be embraced by the Union Army, I was sorely mistaken. A woman doctor, they said? We've never heard of such a thing. Why, women faint and, and swoon at the sight of blood. Why, a woman's brain is too small to contain medical knowledge. Without a commission, without money, I was forced to sleep in the doorways of hospitals. The only food I had was what the soldiers themselves could share with me. It was in Washington that I began to dress as you see me now. Oh, at first, I wore trousers beneath my skirts, but eventually I abandoned skirts altogether. Dresses do nothing more than shackle and enfeeble the wearer. And I can see that you ladies largely agree with me. <laughs> After serving in Washington for a time, the casualties of the war had begun to mount. And so, in the winter of 1862, I left Washington. I wanted to be near the battlefield. I wanted to see what sick men, mangled men, and dying men must endure. And so I went to Fredericksburg, Virginia. My introduction to battlefield medicine began at Fredericksburg. Now, you may have forgotten what happened at Fredericksburg in the winter of 1862. Lincoln had fired General McClellan, 
And now there was a new general, Ambrose Burnside. Burnside, in, a, in an attempt to prove himself, was going to make a bold move. He was going to take the town of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Fredericksburg, let me remind you, lies midway between Washington to the north, Richmond to the south. Fredericksburg, a key location in between. Burnside knew that in order to take the Confederate-held town, he would have to cross his men across the Rappahannock River. But it was December. The river was swollen with rain. Burnside ordered pontoons to convey the men across, but it was too late. The pontoons were delayed, giving Lee's Confederate forces a chance to occupy the town, and not just occupy the town, but occupy the heights above it. Now, my friends, imagine with me, you are Burnside's Union forces. I represent Lee's forces on the heights above Fredericksburg. You have the superior number, but on the heights, who has the true advantage? When one of Burnside's lieutenants saw his plan to take the town, he said, the carrying out of your plan, General, will be murder, not warfare. And murder it was. The men fell with a steady drip, drip, drip of rain from the eaves of a house. The whole field was littered with dead and dying. Those who were left alive piled bodies around them for warmth and protection. They spent the night listening to the thud of bullets into dead flesh. One soldier wrote, I had never before seen fighting like that. Nothing approaching it in its terrible uproar and destruction. After the battle was over, Robert E. Lee walked out onto the field and looked out over his victory. And he said, it is well that war is so frightful. Otherwise, we should become too fond of it. The sounds of the battle were over now, but now new sounds rose from the field. Some men called out to their mothers. Some called out to God to help them. Some called for a friendly soldier to come and finish him off. That night, the northern lights rose high in the sky, turning it the color of blood and bone. And the angel of death descended to gather her harvest. So now, what has become of our young soldier, so brave, so certain that the war would be over in a few short months? He, like thousands of others, lay wounded on the field. If he was bleeding badly, his body would have frozen to the ground in the December cold. We divided the wounded into three groups. The first, those who were shot in the head or the torso, were beyond help. We called them nearing the shore. The only thing we could do, if the soldier was still conscious, was to call another soldier to come and take down his last letter home. There were those who were less seriously wounded, those who could be given a shot of morphine or, or some whiskey and could make their way to a hospital or some sort of transport 
that could take them somewhere where they could receive medical attention. We called them the walking wounded. And then there were those requiring amputation. No one who ever witnessed an amputation could forget the screams, the flies, the terrible stench. Prior to the war, few soldiers, few surgeons had ever before performed an amputation. It was not unusual for a surgeon to be performing an amputation while someone stood nearby reading instructions on how to do it from a book or pamphlet. We wiped our instruments on bloody and pus-stained aprons. We held knives between our teeth and then rinsed them in dirty basins of water. If water was scarce, we went for days without washing our hands. We went for days without sleep as well. The awful cutting went on and on and on. We stitched the wounds closed with linen or cotton thread, and then we waited for the dreaded surgical fevers to begin blood poisoning, erysipelas, the awful rot of hospital gangrene. It was unstoppable. We doctors fumbled and stumbled our way out of the darkness of ignorance, but it was not soon enough. That, my friends, was the work of war. Work I did without recognition and without compensation. I personally petitioned Secretary of War Edwin Stanton for a commission, but again and again it was denied me. It seemed as though it was perfectly fine for a woman laundress to travel with the Union Army, but not a woman physician. Denied, denied, denied. If a man had done what I have done for my country, a star would be snatched out of the heaven and placed on his shoulder, and he would be declared a national hero. Denied, denied, denied. When I was denied the rank of major, a rank to which I was fully entitled, I simply made my own major's uniform and wore it proudly without apology. Do I seem angry? Yes, I was angry. When, after the war, I went to President Grant and asked for a military appointment and he refused to see me, I simply camped out in the White House and cooked my meals on a special stove that I bought for that purpose. Afterwards, President Grant said, it was easier to take the Confederate Capitol at Richmond than to argue with Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. <laughs> yes, I was angry, but I was not defeated. Just as the Union Army carried on in the face of disappointment, and defeat, so I too carried on. In the spring of 1864, I found myself in Tennessee, caring for the wounded in the aftermath of the Battle of Chattanooga and Chickamauga. And there, I met a great man, finally, a man with guts and good judgment, General George Henry Thomas the Rock of Chickamauga, who recognized my abilities. And so, at long last, in March of 1864, General George Henry Thomas made me, Dr. Mary Walker, the first female physician in the United States Army. Yes, some applause is appropriate here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
I was assigned to an Ohio Infantry Regiment, the Ohio 52nd Volunteer Infantry Regiment, under Colonel Daniel McCook. Daniel McCook was a fine man and a kind man. When I was not needed to tend his soldiers, he sent me out into the Tennessee countryside to care for the civilians who were hard pressed for medical care in the long years of war. I stitched wounds, delivered babies, pulled teeth, that sort of thing. It was dangerous work. I was often behind enemy lines. I could have been captured or, or killed at any moment. Some days, Daniel McCook sent an escort out with me. But some days, I went out unescorted and alone. My luck ran out. April of 1864, I was captured by the Confederates. I was accused of spying for General Sherman, and I was sent to a prison in Richmond, Virginia, called Castle Thunder which is every bit as terrifying as its name suggests. When the men of the Ohio 52nd heard that I had been captured, some of them cried. They said, our dear Mary, she is in God's hands now. Please protect her. But in truth, those four months that I was in prison, it was my boys of the Ohio 52nd who were in God's hands and who needed protection. I was not with them, but they moved on down through Tennessee, winning victory after victory, on into Georgia, victory after victory, coming ever closer to that prize, Atlanta. Victory after victory until they came to a place called Kennesaw Mountain. No, I was not with my boys then, but I can tell you their story. You see, the story of the men of the Ohio 52nd at Kennesaw Mountain, it's the kind of story men tell around a campfire when they wish to tell stories of uncommon courage the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain was the kind of battle where, before going in, the men wrote their names on pieces of paper, the names of their towns and their necks of kin, and they pinned it to their coats so that their bodies or what was left of them could be identified later on. No, I was not with them but their story is one that must not be forgotten. On the morning of the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, June 27, 1864, there is a stillness among the men from Ohio, a hush. Their commander, Daniel McCook, stands before them, preparing them for battle. The men know that McCook is not the kind of commander who will send them forward ahead of him. McCook is the kind of commander who will say, come men, I will lead you. McCook is tall and lean and handsome, just 29 years old. He is a lover of poetry. And so to inspire his men that morning, he recites some poetry for them, reminding them that they are part of the ages, part of a long line of men who have been willing to give their lives for what they believe in. The Ohio 52nd knows that the Confederates are entrenched at the top of Kennesaw Mountain. Their line is in the shape of a fish hook, and the Ohio 52nd is given the order to take the lower end. They call it the dead angle. The Ohio 52nd moves out, 
Firing begins immediately. The first to fall is Sergeant Fowler, shot in the shoulder. A young boy, just 17 years old, named Lindsay Street, takes up the banner. He's beloved by his comrades, and he falls. Another takes it up, Sergeant Bradfield, and he falls as well. Another and another and another, and now Daniel McCook is in the lead. He and the men reach the base of Kennesaw Mountain, but pikes and sharpened logs stall them. McCook turns to his men and he says, Come, men, the day is won. And then the men see their beloved commander's chest split open. Courage like blood drains from them all. And then the roar of battle begins again, and another man takes it up, but another falls. Sergeant McCullough, he falls, and another, and another. The ground now is garnished with the dead and dying. The Ohio 52nd is given the order to fall back and reform the line. The men find a momentary depression in the ground around the mountain. Night comes, and they are glad of it. Their canteens are empty, and they're almost out of ammunition. But at the top of the hill, the rebels take handfuls of cotton, soaked in turpentine, and set them ablaze. And they roll them down the hill, setting the dry leaves and twigs on fire, burning and charring the dead. The screams of those who were not dead, but were wounded, fill the night. Perhaps my story should end here with the 3,000 Union dead and the Confederate victory, but it doesn't end here. Perhaps my story should end at Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio, where Daniel McCook, three of his brothers and his father, all of whom gave their lives for the Union cause, lay buried but it doesn't end there either. There is one more story to tell, and perhaps it is the most important story of all. You see, on that day on Kennesaw Mountain, a young boy, a Union soldier, just 17 years old, was shot in the neck, and he fell across Confederate lines. Instead of killing him, or sending him to a prison camp. The Confederates nursed him back to health and later let him recover fully in Macon, Georgia. That young man's name was Newton Bostwick. And after the war, Newton Bostwick became a lawyer and one of the leading citizens of the town of Chardon, Ohio in Geauga County. But Newton Bostwick couldn't stop thinking about those men, those Confederates, the Rock City Guards of Tennessee, who had saved his life that day on Kennesaw Mountain. And so, many years after the war ended, Newton Bostwick wrote a letter to the Nashville newspaper asking for information about those Rock City Guards. Here is his letter. From Chardon, Ohio, March 13, 1880. Dear Sir, I should like to know something of you. You treated me well while I was a prisoner with you in the field that day, June 27th, and I have ever since felt a friendly feeling toward you. 
I am the boy who fell inside your works that warm morning in June. You fought like the devil and made a hot place for us to come through. But it always seemed to me that if we could have held out a little longer, the fortunes of that day might have changed. Please write to me. I want to know what became of you boys. Sincerely, Newton Bostwick. A very short time later, Newton Bostwick received a letter in reply. This is that letter from Nashville, Tennessee, March 17, 1880. Dear Sir, your right interesting favor of March 13 was received today. We right well remember the 27th of June, 1864. I was Sergeant Major and well remember how you was shot through the neck while your men shot at me and that you was a brave boy. We lost but few that day on Kennesaw Mountain because we were well fortified. The slaughter on your part was terrible. We were almost out of ammunition, and I think if you had put another fresh line in, you would have had us. But we had orders to hold that line, and you know what kind of boys we were. Out of 150 Rock City guards, only 50 of us are left. They were all brave boys and they did their duty. I think I can say the same of the Ohio 52nd. We would be glad if you could pay us a visit we would make it a pleasant time for you. The war is over, and we must be the best of friends. Yours truly, James A. Jennings of the Rock City Guards. Now, I am not a woman given to easy tears or sentiments. I have argued with generals I have argued with the President of the United States, and I have always been determined to have the last word. But it seems to me that there are no more true words than those of James H. Jennings of the Rock City Guards. Yes, my friends, the war is over, and we must be the best of friends. Thank you. Thank you.